So, picture this. You are a preteen or adolescent going to school in the early 2000s. You go to the school's computer lab at lunchtime and hey, guess what? There's a free computer. The internet was a pretty different place back in the late 90s and early 2000s. YouTube hadn't come around yet. The only notable social media platforms around at the time were things like LiveJournal and there was pretty much a whole wild west field of just browsing the web back then. Anything could happen. If you were a kid like me during that time though, there were probably a few sites you were going to on a regular basis. YTMND, RuneScape, Neopets, Newgrounds, the list goes on. In particular, sites like the aforementioned Newgrounds hosted not only video animations, which they were primarily known for, but also a treasure trove of web browser-based games. Flash and similar programs like Shockwave don't really exist today, with HTML5 being the current web multimedia standard due to being more secure, but back at that stage of the internet, they were pretty much powering the whole thing. Almost literally. These games were easily accessible on a browser, didn't require any download, and loaded relatively quickly even on a dial-up connection. Perfect for a middle school kid trying to play a quick game of Ultimate Flash Sonic before the computer lab staff saw what you were doing. The vast majority of these games were pretty crude even by then current standards, and understandably so, but there were some bangers here and there. Alien Hominid was a new grounds run and gun game so good, the creator actually struck a deal to make it into a full-fledged console game with a physical release and everything. I had the GameCube port of this growing up, and it was bizarre seeing the new grounds logo on the opening copyright screens on boot. Sites for TV channels like Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network had surprisingly thoughtfully made games, with Nickelodeon in particular having some ambitious 3D rendered games, like a snowboarding game based on Rocket Power, and a Hey Arnold tie-in game based on the movie that's essentially a crazy taxi send-up. Really impressive stuff for the time. There were games for every gaming genre out there, and of course this includes fighting games. This video is going to be a bit different from my usual fare, because I really won't be touching too much on mechanical depth, because it'd be kind of unfair to hold these games up to the same standard as professionally developed fighting games by far larger development teams. And as someone that remembers when these games were new and wasn't really bothered by the jank at the time because hey, free computer fighting games, I thought it'd be fun to take a look back on this specific internet time capsule. Now, there were a ton of these games out there back then, and I can't reasonably cover them all in one video, so I instead narrowed it down to a few specific games I wanted to talk about. They're the ones I probably have the most nostalgia for, and they were pretty popular browser games in their own right, so they might bring back memories for you too. So, without further ado... So, what happens when you take Dragon Ball? Street Fighter, Tekken, Mortal Kombat, and throw in a bunch of extra stuff on top of it that doesn't really make any sense being there, but no one's really there to tell you no? Well, the answer to that these days is Mugen, but in the context of early 2000s internet, the answer was Bloody Rage. This was a 2D flash fighter developed by Cessnet, with what was at the time probably the craziest character roster of all time in any fighting game, professionally developed or otherwise. You've got fighting game characters like Ken, who's actually in this over Ryu, believe it or not, Jin and Scorpion, Marvel heroes like Spidey, Wolverine, Hulk, and Blade of All characters, and then a bunch of miscellaneous characters like Jason, Goku, Cloud, Lara Croft, Optimus Prime, and Yoda to name a few. Every character in the game is renamed to something similar to their actual name, but not quite. Jason is now Jason, but with a Y. Blade is now Blade, but with a Y, and so on and so forth. What makes this game particularly weird from a gameplay standpoint is that the character move list itself is honestly kind of impressively sized. But there's just the one move list. Every character in the game shares the same exact move list, and it's a combination of attacks from some of the characters on the roster. So the Harpoon special for example is Scorpion Spear. You can do a Hadoukenesque fireball, and so on. Though Blanca Ball is in the game for whatever reason too. You choose one of the 18 characters and fight your way through the appropriately named Bloody Rage tournament. Before the fights start proper, the game does something that's actually kind of interesting. In order to qualify for the tournament, you have to participate in the barrel breaking minigame. Break 10 and you can start the fights in earnest. 
Since there is no training mode or anything, this actually kind of works as a way to familiarize yourself with the controls, moveset, and general game feel before playing the game proper. It's not the most elegant solution in the world, but it is a solution. The game itself is... yeah, not great. You basically just spam attacks and hope for the best. Whether your opponent down and you'll get the finish imprompt from Mortal Kombat, which isn't just for show, there's actual fatalities in the game. So, if the game really isn't all that fun to play, why is it that I have a ton of nostalgia for it? Well, allow me to introduce Construct Mode. This was a mode that essentially lets you create a custom character made up of bits and pieces of characters from the main roster. So if you wanted a character with Cloud's head, Superman's suit and cape, Wolverine's claws and Jin's pants, yeah, you can make it happen. I can't underline enough just how many hours I'd spend on the computer as a kid making the most appalling abominations humankind has ever seen. Even if the game's fighting mechanics aren't very great, or barely function for that matter, I think the construct mode in particular kind of captures what makes customization in series like Tekken and Soul Calibur so fun. Sometimes you just want to create an affront to existence and punch things in the face, and to its credit, Bloody Rage was good for that. I had completely forgotten until putting together this video, but Bloody Rage actually got a sequel a few years later after the first game, and what's interesting about it is that this one's in 3D. You can move your character around akin to a 3D fighter, and there's a completely separate button for jumping. There is only one attack button though, so as you'd expect, there's really not much to offend in this game. The most interesting thing I found about it is the fact that character customization returns, letting you customize the character models. The models themselves aren't great, but I'm kind of blown away by how many options you get for customizing them in this game. There's a ton of secret characters, but I have no idea how to unlock them, and searching if there were any known codes to unlock anything turned up nothing. Two box in the game though. Bloody Rage 2 ends up kind of like the previous game. Kind of a jank experience with some surprisingly dope customization options. I've been a comic book fan for as long as I can remember, and one of the earliest series I was introduced to when getting into the hobby was Marv Wolfman and George Perez's new Teen Titans run from the 80s, thanks to a friend's relative offloading some of their old issues to my friend, who gave them to me. That got me interested in seeing if there was a newer version of the book, and thankfully for me, there was in the form of Jeff John's Teen Titans run, which had only just started around that same time. What had also started airing around that same period was the 2003 Teen Titans cartoon. As a fan of the DC Animated Universe stuff from Bruce Timm, like Batman the Animated Series and Justice League Unlimited, I was locked in, even if this was its own thing. Compared to its DCAU contemporaries, Teen Titans was a bit more serialized, and every season had an overarching storyline that would usually come to a head in the last few episodes of any given season. If you grew up on this show, then I don't need to explain how awesome it was. Because the show primarily aired on Cartoon Network, that meant that it was only a matter of time before it got its own game on their website. And boy did it ever. When Cartoon Network dropped Teen Titans Battle Blitz, it hit school libraries and computer labs like a new drug hitting the streets. This game is the reason why my middle school's computer lab started installing website blockers. This is probably a good time to mention that Battle Blitz is technically not a flash game but a shockwave game. It's easy to conflate the two because of the confusing branding during that time. Shockwave was born from the company Macromedia. Macromedia originally had a program called Macromedia Director, and things developed with Director could be viewed and played within another plugin, Macromedia Shockwave. Flash, on the other hand, started out as Future Splash, originally developed by a company named Futurewave, before they were acquired by Macromedia and the software was renamed Macromedia Flash with the plugin additionally being renamed Macromedia Flash Player. While both Shockwave and Flash worked in web browsers, Flash was considerably more lightweight, something not to be taken for granted considering the amount of people using 56k dial-up connections at the time. Due in part to this, Flash became the more dominant plugin in the late 90s into the 2000s. Because Shockwave was the general shorthand used for things made with Macromedia Director, this caused some confusion when Adobe acquired Macromedia in late 2005, who retained the legacy nickname of Shockwave Flash, even though that program is Shockwave in name only. 
So basically, Shockwave Flash is Flash, but Shockwave Player is its own thing, if that makes any sense. Battle Blitz is a one-on-one -on -one fighting game where you pick a member of the Teen Titans and face off against five villains from the series, though you can do the reverse and choose the villains and face off against the Titans instead. I specifically remember when the game launched, Robin was the only playable character, and the rest were time-locked, becoming playable over the course of the following weeks. Time-locked characters are something quite a few arcade games did, where some characters would only unlock after the game has locked a certain amount of time or a certain play milestones were reached, the arcade versions of Tekken 5 and Marvel vs. Capcom 2 being two prominent examples. This kind of thing even extended to the 2D fighter resurgence in the late 2000s, where Akuma was a timed unlock for vanilla Street Fighter 4 cabinets, while Ro and Jun the Swan in the Japanese arcade release of Tatsunoko vs. Capcom were timed unlock set to become playable the same day the home console port for the Nintendo Wii released. This even extended to console fighters too. Who can forget leaving their GameCube zone overnight to fulfill the 20 hours of game time required to unlock Mewtwo in Melee? Back on topic, every character has a moveset consisting of around 3 or so moves, with an assist attack from a character that functions as a super of sorts that does pretty good damage. What the game doesn't tell you is that every hero character actually has access to the entire Teen Titans roster as assists, as long as you know the specific button combinations for each one. These one-time assist attacks do a ton of damage and aren't blockable, so if you get a life lead, you can nearly guarantee a round just by rushing them with the team attacks though you don't get to use them for the rest of the match once you've expended all of them. Despite the relatively compact movesets, there's a few interesting things differentiating everyone. For example, Robin and Starfire both have a dive kick that can be done by pressing kick in the air. Beast Boy has one too, but his travels in a small arc. Raven doesn't have a kick, instead hovering for a bit and spinning a projectile around her. Cyborg doesn't have one at all though preferring to play a more ground-based game instead. Robin and Starfire can mix up their playstyles between zoning with projectiles and closing the distance with their dive kicks, though Robin, weirdly enough, has more effective projectiles than Starfire. Raven is a dedicated zoner, using her powers to throw a bunch of objects at you. There's a neat little detail in regards to her here. The objects she throws at you change with every stage in the game. Cyborg is kinda weird. He has a projectile with huge startup time but okay active frames, but also has a head stomp attack and a tackle that sends him into the air where he's kind of a sitting duck. Beast Boy predictably transforms into animals for most of his attacks, so he's a bit more in your face than the others. This gets even funkier when you look at the villains though. Jinx is just about the only one that plays traditionally. Gizmo is a zoner whose kick button puts him into a permaflight mode of sorts where he can move around the screen freely and he gets access to more of his moveset. He actually kind of reminds me of a cross between the idea behind MODOK in Marvel vs. Capcom 3 and Pet Shop in the Capcom JoJo's fighter, which is pretty funny to think about. He also has a pretty hilarious running animation. Mimoth has no kick button to speak of, so all of his attacks are punches and tackles. I guess he's kind of the Balrog function, if Balrog had a ground pound. Cinderblock actually kind of vaguely reminds me of Juggernaut in Marvel vs. Capcom, given the massive size and his power stomp having similar properties to Juggernaut's Earthquake. But there's one massive caveat. Cinderblock can't actually jump, so you're exclusively playing the ground game with him. Plasmus also lacks the ability to jump and kick, but functions more so as a zoner so I'd say they fare better than Cinderblock. You can block in this game, but it's not quite evident at first. Instead of holding back, you have to hold down back. There's no animation for it, but it does reduce damage. I'm going to assume this is less on whoever programmed this and more on whoever made the assets. The block function's fine, so maybe they had to work with whatever the people doing the art gave them. Motion inputs in this game are standard 2D fighter fare. You can piano them on a keyboard to have them work essentially like Street Fighter motions, but on paper, they have more in common with Mortal Kombat inputs. 
Kind of funny, since some of these characters actually went on to become playable in the Injustice games almost a decade later. As far as aesthetics go, the UI for this game is pretty slick for a browser fighter. It's clear, easily readable at a glance and not unpleasant to look at. Sadly, there's no local multiplayer for the game, which is kind of a shame. Honestly, revisiting this game was a way more pleasant experience than I remembered. Normals in this game aren't the greatest, so neutral really does come down to using your special moves to either whiff punish or to force an opening. The AI in the game gets kind of wild on the hardest difficulty, but you can cheese them with projectile oriented characters like Raven as well. For as simple as the game is, I still had a lot of fun coming back to it, and I'd actually recommend it for being fun in the same way Dive Kick is, by nature of it boiling down fighting games to the absolute basics. Street Fighter Online is another shockwave powered game I wanted to talk about because I spent way too much time as a kid playing this. Despite the name, this one's a take on the Marvel vs games, with several Marvel characters from the series being playable in addition to the Street Fighter characters. This is a 6 button fighter just like Street Fighter, but the movesets are pared back a bit from the vs games proper, though there's some new hyper combos here and there. Some are cool and some are weird, like this tornado one Captain America has for some reason. There's assist characters here as well, and they function similarly to how assists work in Marvel 1, where they'll be randomly assigned to you, and they're all characters not on the playable roster. They even made assists that hadn't existed in the Marvel vs games for this like Blanca and Gen. Now this all sounds good, but does the game actually play well? Well, not quite. Hit and hurt boxes in this seem kind of funky, and characters have way too much health for their own good. The game runs at 40 frames per second, so it feels pretty jerky to control, though it's a far cry from how I experienced the game in my youth. Back then, I'm pretty sure the frame rate was like half of that, if not more, and fights would quite literally take upwards of 5 minutes or more because everything moved so slowly. Still didn't stop me from playing the absolute hell out of it back then though, but still. Some characters are just clearly stronger than others, and not even in the usual versus series tradition of there being really strong characters, but more so in the wow is there any reason to not pick Sentinel flavor of balance. Despite super jumps and flight being implemented here, air combos aren't really a thing in this game, though you can do some hilarious corner juggles in the corner relatively easily. This game also had online play as well, and now that I'm thinking about it, this might have actually been my first ever fighting game netplay experience, which is kind of funny to think about. While I'm using a version of the game with everything unlocked to play this today, at the time, some characters were locked behind having to get a certain number of recorded wins in the game, which is pretty good incentive to continue playing I'd say. The thing I most vividly remember from this game though is its story mode, which felt like kind of a big deal to have in a browser fighter in that day and age. Now let me set expectations here, it's not spectacular or anything, and really just boils down to some generic text between fights with the characters you chose, but still, no other shockwave of flash fighting game was doing this at the time. They'd actually go on to expand on it more with a second story arc revolving around Wolverine and the Weapon X program. Here the presentation takes a step up by actually incorporating comic book panels and dialogue, which is pretty cool I have to admit. In particular, there's a fight where you control Onslaught against the heroes. If you win, the story moves on, but if you lose, you actually get an alternate ending sequence before being met with the game over screen, which is a surprisingly cool detail to stick in. Overall, I didn't find myself enjoying this as much as I did when I was younger, but I still think it deserves a little praise for all the stuff it accomplished within the confines of a browser game, and I'm glad it exists. Platform Fighters were also a game with some representation in the browser game space. One of the games I had wanted to talk about was Newgrounds Rumble, but I couldn't get it working on my end for some reason, though it should be technically possible to do so. Even then though, it's still probably dwarfed in popularity by a fan game series styled after the most famous platform fighter of all time. Super Smash Flash is basically exactly what it says on the tin, a Flash based Super Smash Bros. fan game. Developed in four months solely by Gregory McLeod, the namesake of McLeod Gaming, Smash Flash initially started development as a Sonic fan game before pivoting into Smash. The game's aesthetics and features are based primarily off of Super Smash Bros. Melee, 
with modes like Classic and Adventure being implemented, as well as Stadium modes like 10-man melee, 100-man melee, Pro melee, and Target Test being available. Classic mode is essentially the same as it is in Smash. You fight opponents one by one, sometimes under unique circumstances, until you beat the final boss, Master Hand. Adventure mode is also styled after Smash Melee, though there's definitely more in the way of platforming stages in this mode. You still get regular fights sprinkled in between, though. The game has items just like Melee as well, and you'll find everything from the bumper, green shells, fans, and healing items like the Maxim Tomato and the Heart Container. The game also even keeps track of data to the same extent Melee does, logging any in-game achievements you've made, and even breaks down usage stats on a character-by-character -character basis. Extremely impressive details considering most probably never even looked at those menus. The moment-to-moment -moment combat isn't really anything to write home about. You get a double or multi-jump depending on the character and an attack button. Holding a direction and an attack will give you different attacks like in Smash though there's no distinction between special and regular attacks here. That said, it's kind of understandably jank. Hit stun is inconsistent, hitboxes are pretty weird, and damage and knockback are seemingly random. Then again, a lot of those same things can be said about Super Turbo, so hey. In all seriousness though, the easiest way to kill anything in the game is to rack damage up with side attacks before letting your opponent come to you using the up attack as a kill move. The momentum almost always launches them off screen. Let's talk about the roster though, as that's the biggest selling point of a Smash game, fan-made or otherwise. You have Smash standbys like Mario, Link, Samus, Kirby, and Pikachu, and given this game's origins as a Sonic fan game, it's no surprise that not only Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles show up, but also a fan OC by the name of Blade. You have Mega Man X here as well, which is funny since classic Mega Man would eventually get into Smash 4. Like the Smash series proper though, part of the fun is unlocking the other characters, and there's a good amount of stuff to uncover here. As in Smash, characters are unlocked by fulfilling special conditions. For example, Jigglypuff is unlocked by beating Adventure Mode with any character. Super Sonic can be unlocked by clearing Classic Mode with Sonic on very hard difficulty. Characters like Yoshi, Zero, and Shadow start showing up, and even folks like Chrono and Cloud Strife are on the table here. But then we start getting into funny inclusions like Naruto, Mr. Incredible, and Inuyasha of all characters. I don't hate the idea or anything, but it very much reads like a fan wishlist for Brawl circa 2006-2007, and there's some charm to seeing all of that realized in a fan game setting. It's understandable why character unlocks in fighting games were phased out, and I 100% get it. But man. There's nothing like that dopamine hit you get from seeing that warning challenger approaching screen in Smash games, and Smash Flash of nothing else actually captures that feeling fairly well in spite of all of the jank. Like in Melee, character unlocks will even affect adventure mode in some small cases, like the giant Pikachu fight becoming a giant Jigglypuff fight instead once you unlock them. Smash Flash 2 would begin development not too long after the first game, with progress being marked with a series of demos over time. This time around, McCloud had a team of people helping with development, and it definitely showed in pretty much every aspect of the game, even in the early demos. While still a little janky at first, the demos eventually evolved and grew, and the game in its current form is essentially at a point where it's just flat out a legitimately great fan game. For one, the game actually plays a lot closer to Smash now, with there being a distinction between tilts, melee attacks, and special moves as well as rolls, shields, throws, and spot dodging being implemented. There's a legit combo game here now, and it honestly feels pretty great. The roster is even bigger, and while it doubles down on the anime characters, which again is okay with me, it does away with the OCs. The game's presentation in general seems to largely use Super Smash Bros. Brawl as a template, which makes sense, since that was the most recent Smash game when this began development. I legitimately hooked up a controller to my PC and used that to play a good chunk of this recently, and it's one of those games I think I'll actually revisit every now and then. If you like Smash, there's no reason not to give this a shot. It runs on a toaster and isn't hard to acquire at all. One really neat thing about this series is seeing what people involved with it went on to do. McLeod himself went on to work on a few indie games, most recently and notably having worked on the indie platform fighter Framemakers. The announcer for Smash Flash 1 was a younger Kira Buckland, 
who of course went on to voice quite a few characters in anime and gaming, most notably to be in Nier Automata. Nickelodeon has an entire series of crossover fighters predominantly made in Flash under the Super Brawl name. These are fairly standard, simple fighters with a punch and kick button along with an aerial attack and one special move per character. The first game, weirdly enough, has a bunch of seasonal revisions available, each building off the last, so it kind of unintentionally feels a bit like Street Fighter 2 in those regards. There's some fun fighting game nods in this, like Spongebob who instead of donning his karate gear like you'd expect, wears gi and a headband very similar to Ryu, and just in case you think you're overthinking it, his special move is a bubble hadouken, complete with a quarter circle forward esque motion. I don't think this one is a reference to the concept or anything, but Timmy also has a literal footsies button, which is hilarious. The first release of this was Jingle Brawl, which was suitably Christmas themed. This version, weirdly enough, had certain characters, stages, and game modes locked behind cheat passwords, though they're relatively easy to track down. The second revision is simply titled Super Brawl and adds Dr. Bloho from the Penguin Show along with a new stage. Beating him in the tournament mode unlocks both of them. The third variant of this was Super Brawl Summer, which you guessed it, is summer themed. The main additions are two new characters, Bessie from the Mighty Bee and Patrick, both with new stages, though the latter character and stage need to be unlocked by beating them in tournament mode. The last version is Super Fall Brawl, and this one is kind of hilarious. The major addition here is Sheen, as he's seen in his spin-off show, Planet Sheen. Here's the thing though, I don't know if it's a programming error or not, but Sheen is absolutely cracked in this. His speed and damage output is insane, his AI moves around like he's in Marvel 2, and at one point he even chips me out with a block stun infinite. Apparently this led to a lot of people complaining about the game's difficulty, especially since Sheen was also the final boss of the game's tournament mode. The devs would update the game not too long after release, and instead of toning Sheen down, they just straight up deleted him from the game. No official reasons given, no fanfare, just poof, gone. Imagine if say Capcom just straight up deleted Bison from ROM revisions and Champion Edition arcade cabinets. That's basically what happened here. Super Brawl 2 is the first numbered sequel to the original game. It plays fairly similarly and retains the roster of the previous games, including Sheen, who has been toned down a bit from Fall Brawl, but still ends up being one of the best characters in the game thanks to his kick launcher leading the infinites. The best character overall is probably Skipper though. He's got an absurdly active jump in, a ridiculously good projectile that hits three times and can combo into itself if you space it properly, and a pretty ridiculous super move on top of it all. There's a ton of new characters in the game, including a new variant of Spongebob that has a moveset and design more in line with his antics in his cartoon, though the Ryu homage version from the first game remains on the roster as well. There's two major mechanics added to the sequel this time around, Tag Mode and Supers. Tag Mode lets you have 2v2 fights, allowing you to swap between characters on the fly with the spacebar, which is pretty neat. There's a super bar added that fills up the same way it does in most other traditional fighting games, and doing the motion for your regular special attack when the meter is full initiates the super. Interestingly enough, in tag mode, your characters don't share a meter like in most traditional tag fighters, but instead have separate ones. There's a survival mode as well, which sees you taking on opponents rapid fire on a single health bar until you get KO'd. Super Brawl 3 Good vs Evil is the next sequel up, and it's notable for quite a few reasons. For one, the development changed hands from MP Game Studios to Working Man Interactive. The engine also feels a little different from the previous entries, and not in a particularly great way. Hit Stun almost seems like a foreign concept in this game, and I almost feel like it may have been an overcorrection of some of the silly infinites you can do in Super Brawl 2 specifically. The most obvious upgrades though are absolutely in its presentation. The game uses 2D flash art instead of a mix of 3D models and 2D art, so it gives the game a nicer, more cohesive feel. As the game's subtitle implies, this entry focuses on both heroes and villains from Nickelodeon shows, so there's some pretty interesting roster picks all around. The 2012 Ninja Turtles are in here, fresh off Nickelodeon's acquisition of the IP, and you also have the Ubisoft Rabbids in here as well, thanks to their Nickelodeon cartoon. The avatar picks in here are pretty interesting. 
Korra is an obvious pick, but bringing Aang back from the previous games and in his adult form at that is a pretty inspired move I've gotta say. Amon made the roster, which makes sense, but I think the funniest inclusion is Tano. Who would have ever called that? The biggest addition to the game this time around is the fan system, which essentially functions as the game's assists. After choosing your character, you're asked to pick between a boy or a girl, and this dictates what fans you can choose. These fans are essentially original characters based on characters either on the roster or series represented on the roster. When the super meter in game fills, you can press a special attack button to summon them for an assist hyper. In hindsight, it's actually kind of similar to the assist call in the Teen Titans game, only tied to a meter this time around. Speaking of controls, they're largely the same here, though characters have more unique inputs for this special attack this time around, which is nice. There's a story mode, but it's essentially the same as the tournament mode from previous games. There's also notably an online multiplayer mode as well, though I couldn't get it working for obvious reasons. Super Brawl 3 didn't get an update, but a spin-off instead, just got real. This is an April Fool's gag version of the game with a smaller character and stage roster, but the catch is that every character looks realistic. So Spongebob looks like a sponge, the Ninja Turtles look like actual turtles, and so on. This is the kind of silly shit I can absolutely get behind, so I don't have any issues with this game existing. Downsized roster aside, the game itself is largely the same as Super Brawl 3 though the fan system has been removed. Super Brawl 4 is... different. This one is the first to be built in HTML5 instead of Flash, but it's still a working man interactive developed game. The combat in this is massively simplified from the previous games. Fighting essentially boils down to mashing the spacebar, though dashing forward also counts as an attack. You can jump as well, but you jump in an arc automatically when doing so, so it takes a bit to adjust to. The premise of this one is superhero oriented, and there's even a funny little intro sequence when starting the game's story mode. The characters in game are all either characters that are already heroes like Korra, who exclusively plays in her avatar state here, and the Ninja Turtles, or characters like Spongebob who has forms based on Mermaid Man as well as his own superhero identity. You've also got some Power Rangers in here which is pretty cool. To the game's credit, it looks pretty decent. Super Brawl 3 and 4 are definitely a step up visually from the previous games, and I don't really think that's up for debate. But, and I can't believe I'm about to say this, there's an earnest charm to the jank of the earlier entries, particularly Super Brawl 2, which is kind of unironically fun to mess around with in spite of being busted. A cursory look around the internet seems to indicate I'm not actually alone in thinking that. Super Brawl 2 generally seems to be the entry a lot of people look back on fondly. That's going to do it for this video. Hopefully, some of these games may have jogged some pleasant childhood internet memories for you all. There's way more browser fighters out there that I wanted to talk about, like King of Fighters Wing, Tough Love Arena, and a couple other ones, but the scale of this video kind of grew outside of my initial intended scope for this. I do think I'll probably revisit this subject later on in the follow-up video because it's so fascinating. With that in mind though, what are some browser-based fighting games you remember playing? I'd like to hear from you guys in the comments if you have any suggestions or any fond memories. That said, take care, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.